Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, how Doug Ducey is sworn in today as the state's 23rd governor. We'll update the legislature's legal challenge to Medicaid expansion, and we'll hear about what the business community wants to see in the upcoming legislative session. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The state officially has a new governor. I, Douglas A. Ducey, do solemnly swear. I, Douglas A. Ducey, do solemnly swear. Republican Doug Ducey was sworn in this morning at the state capitol. With his wife and three sons by his side, Ducey took the oath to become Arizona's 23rd governor. Ducey's inauguration speech emphasized his campaign themes of fiscal conservatism and creating opportunities for all Arizonans. Several years ago, our state confronted fiscal problems on a scale few had seen before. But leaders, many of them here today, starting with my predecessor, made the decision to change course and avoid the worst. For that, we owe them our gratitude, and now it is our turn to act. Once again, there's no escaping duty, reality, or arithmetic. We can confront the budget shortfall this coming fiscal year, and we will. It will be said that the state has already found all the savings that can be found. Cut every line item that can be cut, and now every option exhausted, it is for the people to pay for the shortfall with higher taxes. And I will reply, not on our watch. As treasurer of this state, I saw for myself where tax dollars go. I can assure you that a more efficient government is not only necessary, but sensible. In the plainest terms, it's not that the people are taxed too little. It's that their government is spending unwisely. Opportunity for all. This was the defining commitment of my campaign, and you won't hear me changing the subject these next four years. Whether it's spending or the tax code or changes in our public schools and legal system or any other policy question, my first priority is simple. Put more opportunities and greater freedom within reach of all our citizens. Governor Ducey will deliver his first State of the State address next Monday. Other elected officials sworn in today include Secretary of State Michelle Reagan, Attorney General Mark Burnovich, Treasurer Jeff DeWitt, Superintendent of Public Instruction Diane Douglas, and State Mine Inspector Joe Hart. Now one wild card facing Governor Ducey is Medicaid expansion. The state Supreme Court ruled last week that Arizona lawmakers indeed have standing to sue the state's Medicaid expansion program. Here to update what happened and what comes next is Jeremy Duda of the Arizona Capital Times. Jeremy, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So how, before we get to what the Supreme Court did here, how is the legislature challenging Medicaid expansion? Well, they filed a lawsuit back in, I believe, September of 2013, alleging, and their argument was that part of Medicaid expansion, an assessment on hospitals that funds the state's portion of this, violates a provision in the Arizona Constitution known as Prop 108 that was passed in by the voters in 1992. It requires a two-thirds supermajority in the legislature to pass a tax increase, which is generally defined as any increase in state revenue. Now, uh, Governor Brewer and her, uh, you know, her staff, their argument was this does not fall, this is not a Prop 108 doesn't apply as it falls under an exemption for administratively set fees where some, you know, it's set by an administrative head, not by the legislature. But there's other language in uh, you know, Prop 108 that kind of contradicts that. And they've been trying to kind of avoid getting to that point by challenging that, you know, whether or not these lawmakers have standing. And I was going to say, so initially the idea is that the legislature is saying this is a tax. It's not an assessment. It's a tax. You need two-thirds of us to go along with this. You only had a simple majority. Um, we have standing because 
uh, what, our votes were not counted? We lost that particular uh, influence and power and, and standing? Yeah, their argument was that, you know, their votes, if this had been subject to Prop 108 and a two-thirds supermajority, their votes would have been enough to kill it. You know, this passed, you know, comfortably, but not with two-thirds. They didn't, you know, Governor Brewer couldn't round up enough votes for that. And so if Prop 108 had applied, these 36 lawmakers, uh, you know, their votes would have been more than enough to stop this from going into effect. And I, I think the court called it institutional injury to the uh, legislature. And the court, by unanimous decision, said, they do have standing. Yeah, by unanimous decision, even including the three justices that Governor Brewer herself appointed, that, that probably kind of stung. But um, you know, the case law that uh, they've been looking at was usually that it usually said that you know the legislature as a body, as an institution, can sue over an institutional injury. What the Supreme Court said here is this was an individual injury to these folks. You know, their votes, if Prop 108 applies, and they didn't weigh in on that yet, but if it applied, these folks' votes were essentially nullified, and they said that is an, that is an individual injury, and you, can, you have standing to sue. Uh, and the, the governor's side basically saying, we're talking about Governor Brewer's uh, side here, basically saying that uh, they're not, they don't have standing because they're not the ones paying the assessment. Only the hospitals would have standing. Court didn't buy that, did they? No, that was uh, you know part of uh, Governor Brewer's argument, and the problem with that for the opposition side is that these hospitals they pay this assessment, but they get more back in you know federal money for you know paying for all these new Medicaid patients. So you know, why would anyone sue if it's going to cost them money? There are almost every single hospital in the state that pays this assessment gets more back than it pays out, and of the very small number that don't, they're part of hospital systems that do receive more money back than they pay out. So with the court making this decision, how much does this hurt the governor's side? Because it seems from a distance as if the idea of not having standing, they put a lot of, uh, put a lot of uh, emphasis on that. No, sure. I mean, this is potentially catastrophic to Governor Brewer's side and those who supported Medicaid expansion. It's hard not to get the feeling that they were banking an awful lot on yes. not getting standing. And they had their other legal arguments for why they said Prop 108 doesn't apply. But everything came down to standing. And, you know, Brewer won in the uh, Superior Court at the lowest court level. And then the Court of Appeals overturned that and said they had standing. And I remember you know, the, we in the press, we all saw Brewer that day. She had a you know, press conference or something else, and you could tell how visibly upset she was. You know, she gave her speech on whatever her press conference was about, then kind of looked down and let out a deep sigh and said, okay, well, I've got to address this issue too. I mean, clear, she was clearly rattled by that. Uh, rattled by that because they know, that side knows, that that Prop 108 is there, and it's tough to say that the two-thirds doesn't count. Well, I'm sure that's what the other side would say. And if you look at the language, it is, it's kind of difficult to imagine how the pro-expansion side is going to prevail. I mean, you look at the language of Prop 108 and has a list of the things that this applies to. Number one is an increase in a statutorily prescribed state fee or assessment or an increase in a statutorily prescribed maximum limit for an administratively set fee or the imposition of any new state fee or assessment or administratively set fee. You know, the language goes, you know, bureaucratic language like that. But it seems like it's pretty clear that this would apply to something like this. They gave the director of access, the Arizona Medicaid program, authorization to determine the amount of this assessment that would be imposed on hospitals and to determine which hospitals would pay this. And it seems like this covers that. So it goes back to Superior Court, correct? Yeah, this will go back to the lower court now and they'll you know, relitigate the case on the merits of the actual Prop 108 argument, which they, you know, completely sidestepped before because they were just figuring out the standing issue. Will Governor Ducey continue to defend? They, he hasn't really said. You know, uh, you know, Governor Ducey is inheriting a lot of litigation from his predecessor, and on pretty much all of them, uh, his staff uh, has the same answer. You know, we're reviewing it, we're, we're consulting with counsel, we'll determine it once he's sworn in, now he's sworn in, and he has to start making decisions. And this is... You know, this is a big one. You know, this is an issue where, you know, if he stopped defending this, which we've seen, I don't know if in Arizona, but in other states and at the federal level, you know, that would be the end of it and Medicaid expansion would go away completely. Now, I don't know if he'll do that. This would cause, this would be dropping a bombshell on an already frazzled budget situation. So I don't know if he would do that. Plus, I think some of the opponents of Medicaid expansion, I think they would like to see this litigated. Prop 108 has never really been litigated in the courts. And there's a lot of uh, you know, fuzziness over 
what it applies to in terms of fees, assessments. I mean, there's, there's things the legislature's done in the last few years during the last budget crisis that probably would fall under the same argument here that nobody ever challenged. I was going to say, at what point do the courts look, can the legislature basically say, we have decided this is an assessment, not a tax? You can do that up and down the line, can't you? Oh, sure. You know, back in you know, 2009, 2010, 2011, they did this, I mean, nowhere near at this level. But there are a lot of situations where they authorized agency heads to impose fees and they never set an amount that you can do a maximum limit and kind of gave them a blueprint for, hey, here's how much money we think you can get out of this. But nobody ever challenged these things. And those were slightly different situations. Some will argue that these were kind of user fees. You know, there people were paying for services they were getting from these agencies. And, and of course, nowhere near the, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars this hospital assessment brings in. We're looking at the bureaucratic aspect here, logistics, and we're looking at the legal aspect. But let's talk about the human aspect. We're talking, what, 200, 300,000 folks affect, could be affected by this? Um, there are almost 250,000 people, childless adults, who have enrolled with access since the beginning of 2014 when this program went into effect. You know, the Medicaid expansion expands into uh, coverage from 100% of the federal poverty level to 133%. But remember that for a few years earlier, we'd frozen cover and enrollment for mm -hmm. people up to 100%, and that had dramatically downsized the access rules as a budget saving measure. Now those folks are all coming back, and the, the overwhelming majority of the people who've enrolled since then are those people who are technically already covered by state law. We're looking at over, almost 210,000 people, you know, ch you know, childless adults up to 100%, 32, 33,000, maybe probably a little more by now on uh, the 100 to 133 percent, that's, you know, a quarter of a million people right there. You're talking about federal funding that goes away. You're talking about these folks in the hospitals, you know, the, the, the costs that, that we were talking about that got this thing through in the first place, those return. Uh, this is a big deal. Yeah, and then you have you know a few different options for what you do. That you just drop two hundred fifty thousand people right off the bat, or more than that, because yeah. you still have some pre-existing childless adults who are still hadn't dropped their enrollment yet by the time this went into effect. Do you end the you know hundred to hundred and thirty-three percent expansion, which you know state law didn't cover before that, which is a pretty small part, and just pay for the rest out of state funds, which would uh, you know, um, cost a heck of a lot, especially with the billion dollar deficit coming up in the next fiscal year. Well, we shall see what, uh, what happens next. Good stuff, Jeremy. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks. Climb east along US 60, approximately 55 miles from Phoenix, and you'll come to a marker for Picket Post Mountain. Early Mexican residents called it Tordillo Mountain after small birds in the area. In 1870, the soldiers of Indian fighter General George Stoneman renamed it Picket Post Mountain for the sentinels they posted here high above infantry camp established at its base. Within eight years, a town of 2000 called Picket Post, later Pinal City, sprang up to work the Silver King Mine, Arizona's richest silver strike before it petered out. Today, thousands flock to the foothills of Picket Post Mountain to stroll through Boyce Thompson Arboretum, home to more than 6,000 plant species and 270 kinds of birds. The state's legislative session is set to begin next week, and with that in mind, we're spending much of this week hearing from advocates for a variety of issues. We begin tonight with what the business community hopes to see and hear from the legislative session. Joining us now is Glenn Hammer, President and CEO of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and Farrell Quinlan, Arizona State Director for the National Federation of Independent Business. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. All right, Glenn, what does Arizona business want from this legislative session. Well, we, well, first, congratulations to all of our statewide office holders. Uh, today was a great day for the state. And I believe that uh, our, our new governor, Doug Ducey, really hit the right themes today in terms of what the business community wants. Uh, we want to be number one when it comes to job creation. We don't want to hear that Texas is number one or any other state. We want to be number one. We want to set the pace. And we also want a world-class education system, K through 12 system, available to all Arizona and all Arizona kids, regardless of income status. Uh, we recognize that there are some budget challenges, to say the least, 
but we believe that if we grow our economy and have a world-class K-12 system, uh, over time, uh, our state will be in uh, terrific shape. I want to get back to that number one here in a second, but as far as independent business, what do you want to see from the legislature? Well, I think a great uh, exponent of what we're looking for is what uh, Governor Ducey spoke about in his speech today. He was uh, talk about opportunity for all, and I'll read a line from his, uh, from his speech. Opportunity is not a government program planned and distributed by some expert class any more than personal freedom is a favor granted by those in public office. And later on in the speech he talks about um, avoiding placing the political sector ahead of the public interest. And I think that's what small businesses and uh, my members have been looking for um, out of government in Arizona and nationally for, for decades. Have you been getting that out of Arizona government? Um, yes and no. Um, it's, of course, nothing is perfect and there's certain areas we want to see improved. Um, we are very uh, uh, heartened by the fact that uh, Governor Ducey has talked about there will not be tax increases on his watch and that uh, he's going to work for a more efficient and more responsive government when it comes to uh, regulations and, and, and keeping uh, government as a, as, a, as a partner or a helper for businesses to, to comply with regulations that have a, a hammer to, uh, to punish them if they, if they make a mistake. You mentioned you want to hear that Arizona is number one. Why isn't Arizona number one, two, or three? Well, we're, we're moving up the list. I mean, the good news is that the last several years we've been a top 10 state, according to Chief Executive Magazine. Uh, <coughs> but, you know, to have someone of Governor Ducey's caliber, someone that has uh, grown one of the greatest <coughs> brands that have ever been created, in Arizona, uh, Cold Stone Creamery. And, and by the way, that was a nice touch at today's inaugural festivities to be able to enjoy uh, a Cold Stone treat. Uh, to have someone of, of Doug Ducey's caliber being able to sell the state day in, day out, and to have his teams sell the state day in, day out, I believe will make a huge difference. And, and Ted, we were thrilled. His first executive order was to issue a regulatory moratorium for, for all of his agencies. So, th so it, it wasn't just words today. Doug Ducey acted. But, but have regulations, have rules, is that one of the reasons? I mean, we're not growing as fast as Nevada, as Colorado, California, and our New Mexico, we, we're doing okay against them. Thank you for New Mexico. But we're, ha we're, not, we're not achieving what folks want to see achieved. Why again is that? What's well, going on out there? Well, this, the, the structure of the state is a heck of a lot healthier than California. There aren't a lot of businesses that I'm aware of, whether they're small, medium, or large, that are saying, hey, let's look at California as, as, as a model. Uh, we, we've been making progress, but, but, but again, uh, you know, to have a chief executive who is a business person who understands government from his four years as treasurer. And you know, one of the interesting things about the campaign, not once was, was uh, Doug Ducey attacked for his work as treasurer. I mean, he's been a model public servant. He's been one of the state's most successful business people. And you know, thus far, we're extremely encouraged by what we see in terms of his actions and the team that he's building out. As far as independent business, small business, uh, again, th this recovery, we are not recovering at the same rate as the nation. And I know California bashing is, is relatively easy to do and kind of obvious, but by the same token, they're still growing over there at a faster pace than we are. What can the legislature and the governor do uh, to step it up? Well, so much of what goes into growth is being able to uh, predict about government policy, tax policy, regulatory policy, and having Doug Ducey and the legislative leadership team that's being headed by David Gowan in the House and Andy Biggs in the Senate, uh, putting out an agenda that says that we're a welcoming uh, uh, state for small business development, for people to bring uh, jobs to Arizona, either through relocation or expansion. I think there is a you know, a national problem with the uh, uh, economy. A lot of it has to do with policy coming out of D.C. And Arizona is, uh, and it's going to take generations, but we're a very hyper growth state when the country is growing. We grow even faster in the, in the country. But when the country is being sluggish, we uh, like can't get out of that first or second gear um, to, to, to gallop out ahead of the, of the country like we normally do when things are growing um, across the nation. So the hope is, is that we're seeing some good signs nationally about the economy and hopefully Arizona can take advantage of that when 
they know here in Arizona that our policy is sound and the leaders are committed to not pulling out the rug uh, when, when things uh, get a little choppy like they are with the budget. As far as your education, you mentioned education. Um, are Arizona students, are they ready to fill jobs that are, are available and will be available in Arizona? Well, we, we do have a very strong <clears throat> workforce, but you know, overall, we need to improve the system. There are pockets of excellence. We are the only state in the country with three of the top 10 public high schools out of 19,400 reviewed by U.S. News and World uh, Report. We have some of the great traditional public school systems. Mesa uh, would, would come to mind. But, but there are also uh, seas of, of, of areas where, where kids are not having access to a world-class education. And, and, that's, and that's a problem. And that's why you know, I thought it was very encouraging that the governor took a good chunk of the time for his uh, inaugural address to say, uh, this, this stops now in terms of uh, not all Arizonans being able to enjoy a world-class education. Uh, he's not just going to say, let's put dollars and hope for the best. That, that is a bad way to go about business. He's going to say, let's, let's focus on what works in this state and let's, let's make sure that the resources go in that direction. When it comes to higher education, though, can you say, let's cut dollars and hope for the best? I think what the state government is going to have to do is look at its priorities. If it's going to have something that can be put off, um, we have a budget situation that needs to be balanced, and it's really important that we don't get out ahead of ourselves, out ahead of our revenues. So if, if higher education is an area that is um, being scrutinized, I think the entire state government is going to be scrutinized. But if, if higher education is scrutinized, does that not affect, especially for independent businesses, mm -hmm. does that not affect the quality of the workers you're going to wind up getting? Well, I, I believe that if money was the problem in either education or health care, then just pouring more money into it, which we've been doing for the past number of decades, would be the answer and things would be improving. I think what we're seeing is that money may not be the only answer. Just throwing more money at a problem uh, may not be the most effective way, and maybe there are better ways of using the money that we're already uh, spending, or even saving some money on, 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 on breaking the mold in some ways. I mean, some of the very innovative things in education having to do with uh, choice in education um, are actually cheaper, and you get better outcomes for, for student achievement. It always has to be about student achievement. It has to be about what kids are learning, not about how institutions are being funded. One of those molds is Common Core, and the governor did campaign in, in a position that wasn't all that uh, positive toward Common Core. We've got a superintendent of public education who really isn't positive about Common Core. You like Common Core, and you think it's a good thing, don't you? We, we like high standards, and, and throughout the campaign, the governor made clear that any sort of revisions would result in higher standards for, Arizona, for, for Arizona's kids. Uh, we, we, we're going to support any effort that, that raises, that raises the, the bar. At the heart of his proposal, of, of the governor's education proposal, is let's fund those, uh, those institutions, those schools that have waiting lists. Th this is not, uh, and I'll just tell you uh, for me personally, Ted, th this is not something that's theoretical. Uh, you know, my, my five-year-old is in a, a great heart school. She, she won the lottery. Uh, I have a very good friend uh, whose daughter was not quite as lucky. Uh, I, th I think that the governor really focusing on those institutions that Arizona and Arizona's parents want to send their kids to is, 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 is a very meaty and worthwhile uh, endeavor. As far as social impact, uh, social issues impacting Arizona, how much do those things, the 1062s and 1070s of the world, impact independent business, business overall in terms of attracting and retaining? You know, I think a lot of those are hyped up by the media and they and it's it's interesting how we then complain about us having a uh, Arizona having some sort of a uh, image problem when the media is is hyping things that are are divisive I think what Arizona needs to firmly establish is that that not only are we open for business but that when you want to open a business when you want to succeed when you want to employ people that we are here to help you, that the state is here to help you not to be 
a, a, a boot on your neck trying to keep you down or, or trying to find the little thing they can hit you with a fine or a citation for. They are here to help, uh, help you succeed, not in a way that's like a subsidy, but in a way that's you know how best to run your business. Just make sure you stay within the guidelines and, uh, and go out and, and, and be successful. And that's all that small businesses want. It's just the government to leave them alone so they can do what they do best. All right. We have to stop it right there. Gentlemen, good to have you both here. Thanks for Thanks. joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, find out what environmentalists want to see from lawmakers in the upcoming session and hear about a unique funding program for arts projects in Arizona. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thanks for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.